Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. Socialism, Marxism, and Communism. Though described by various names throughout the 20th century, it always left behind the same horrific carnage. Imprisonment, starvation, enslavement, persecution, and mass murder. As many of the, as 140 million people were extinguished. The man chiefly responsible for unleashing this catastrophic worldview upon the world was the German atheist and revolutionary Karl Marx. Paradoxically, the atheist Marx had a strange fascination and affection for Satan, the devil. To explore Marx and his demonic ideology, Dr. Paul Kangor of Gross City College joins us by Skype to talk about his new book, The Devil and Karl Marx. Dr. Kangor, welcome to Digging for Truth. Henry, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. Yes. Such a warm and wonderful topic, eh? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, you know, uh, it is. It's uh, it's a dark topic, and uh, we're again, we're going to be talking about your book here, The Devil and Karl Marx. Uh, that's the topic of, of discussion today. So, Dr. Kengor, you've written a lot about communism, and you've studied a great deal about this subject, but uh, about a third of your book focuses on Marx the man. So I thought, tell the audience about his fascination with the devil and the really the malignant kind of person that he was. Yeah, I mean, th this was not your typical atheist, right? This wasn't your typical sort of garden variety atheism, Henry. So, I mean, he was, Marx said, communism begins where atheism begins. He said the religion is the opiate of the masses, and people very rarely know the, the totality of that quote. He said religion is the, is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of heartless conditions, the soul of a soulless world. It is the opiate of the masses. And he also said there that the criticism of religion is the beginning of all criticism. And he himself, he had he had been born, he was he was Jewish. He was an, an ethnic Jew. And the family, they were religious Jews. He came from a long line family of rabbis, Orthodox rabbis. The the father converted to Christianity about 1819, 1820. So Marx would have been about one or two years old. Uh, some think that the father converted to Christianity out of social pressures of the day and the in the city of Trier, Germany, where, where he grew up. And by the way, very interesting, Trier, Germany is one of the most religious cities in all of Germany. The original cathedral there, the you know the great Gothic cathedral of Trier, was built around the year 330 by Helena, um, St. Helena in some traditions, the mother of Constantine, <laughs> of all things. And it was Helena that made the famous pilgrimage to the Holy Land. It brought back a number of relics, or what she believes were relics, including, including the crown of thorns and even the holy coat, the holy robe that, that Jesus wore on the way to the crucifixion that the Roman soldiers cast lots for. And you know, that holy robe is is there, they believe it is, in the cathedral in Trier. So so Karl Marx was, he himself was baptized around the time he was about five or six years old and was a you know, fairly passionate Christian throughout his teen years until he went off to college. And you know, not an unusual story in that respect. Yeah. And he he connected with an atheistic professor, a, a theology professor who was an atheist. You know, unfortunately, nothing new about that too in our universities today. And a, a professor named Bruno Bauer, who was also very anti-Semitic, and Marx became very anti-Semitic himself. And from there on, there's just this hardcore dedication to atheism, and oftentimes I think kind of. Really chilling, Henry. There, there's, there's Palm Sunday one year that Marx and Bauer, who were founding their Archives of Atheism journal, get on donkeys and ride into the nearby village, mocking the entrance of Christ into, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So there's a kind of aping and mocking of God that we see in Karl Marx and his life really very early on. Yeah, you know, it, it's... What, reading through your book, you know, it's it's necessary to to go into the details that you lay out, but they're very disturbing. Uh, how dark the human soul can be can be. What's strange is that Marx was an atheist, but he wrote poems to the devil and talked about hell. Maybe you could share a little bit about about that as well. 
Yeah, and this is not unusual among among atheists. In fact, I, I also quote Mikhail Bakunin, um, even Saul Alinsky, who, you know, Saul Alinsky in his infamous book, Rules for Radicals, has this infamous acknowledgement to Lucifer as this this first rebel who, who, who bought himself his own kingdom, as he put it. Uh, Mikhail Bakunin, who was a socialist anarchist, try to make sense out of that. It even <laughs> confused Marx. And, and Bakunin was a close friend of Marx. And, you know, he wrote about Satan as this glorious rebel, right, who, who rebelled against God, rebelled against the establishment. And, and Marx had a fascination with the devil. I, I opened the book with stanzas from two different poems, one in 1837, one in 1841. And the first one, 1837, Marx wrote, Thus heaven I've forfeited, I know it full well, my soul once true to God is chosen for hell. And that is, I think, Henry, probably partly autobiographical in his yeah. case, because his, yeah, his soul was once true to God. He forfeited heaven. I don't know if it was chosen for hell, but but you know he seems to have made the choice to 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 forfeit heaven himself. And I open with another another poem from Marx called "The Player," 1841, and he said, "See this sword, this blood dark sword, which stabs unerringly within thy soul, till the hellish vapors rise and fill the brain, till I go mad, utterly insane. See this sword, the Prince of Darkness sold it to me." I mean, really chilling stuff. And in, in these and so many other Marxist writings, this isn't just somebody you know, who's kind of playing with this stuff. I think there's something much worse to it. He, he wanted to be nothing less than the Goethe of his age. Goethe wrote Faust, the famous Faustian bargain with the devil, the, the demonic character Mephistopheles. And, and friends and associates of Marx said that he could be seen not just reciting, but chanting lines from Mephistopheles, including his favorite. And this is really quite remarkable. Everything that exists deserves to perish. Everything that exists deserves to perish. So uh, yeah, that's the sort of um, dark worldview that, that, that Marx was tapping into and drew a lot of his inspiration from. Yeah, like uh, again, as I mentioned, as you re as you read through that, I never knew this about Marx. I mean, I've known about Marxism and communism and how abhorrent it has been for the last century or so, and what it's done to the Western civilization, uh, what it's done to people, how it's tried to infiltrate the church. But I, but the spiritual connection that you're making is really important. So. Uh, we'll pick up in our next segment, uh, Dr. Kangor, a little bit. Well, I want to finish up about Marx's personality and character and connect it to his ideology. And friends, thank you for joining us for this episode of Digging for Truth. We'll be right back with Dr. Paul Gengor, Kangor talking about his book, The Devil and Karl Marx. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. Today I'm here with Dr. Paul Kengor of Grove City College, and we're talking about his book, The Devil and Karl Marx. Now, Dr. Kengor, we were talking about Marx's sort of personal fascination with the devil. One of the things that you say in your book is that we can't separate the man from his ideology. Could you uh, expand upon that for our audience, please? Yeah, so much so. I mean, it goes right into his personal life, sort of a segue from, from those poems. The poems, he's talking about pacts with the devil, death, 
despair, destruction. You know, as he put it in, in a letter to one of his friends, the ruthless criticism of everything that exists. And and you see that in the opiate of the masses essay, where he says the beginning of religion, the criticism of religion is the beginning of all criticism. He uses the word criticized 29 times in that essay. And, 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 he, and he says in the Communist Manifesto, communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement that goes against the existing social and political order of things. Things. He said, communism seeks the most radical rupture in traditional relations. I mean, these, these are really remarkable statements. He said, the communists, the communists support the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. And in his poetry, he writes about suicide pacts, pacts with the devil. I mean, this, this is really quite chilling, Henry. Karl Marx had two daughters who committed suicide in suicide pacts with their husbands. By taking poison, Marx writes in his poems about pale maidens who, who ingest poison to kill themselves in suicide packs. I mean, th this is a striking case of somebody where the personal really becomes the public, the political, the ideological, the philosophical, the, you know, the religious. You know, th there is this isn't just a matter of exposing somebody's personal beliefs to attack him personally and thereby question his beliefs and ideology. No, the beliefs and ideology are a direct extension of the personal. And you see that throughout the Communist Manifesto. Yeah, and you, and you, ex you extensively discuss this in that section of your book where you talk about Marx the man and his personal life and all that. And I want to encourage, again, people to pick up a copy of your book so we can ex they can explore that in a much deeper way. One of the things you quote here is that Aristotle, the philosopher, Men start revolutions for reasons connected to their personal lives. Oh, it's so true for Marx, and and uh, the the hypocrisy in Marx's life is incredible. The the Communist Manifesto listed a ten point plan. It's, this includes abolition of property. In fact, you know, it says in the Communist Manifesto. The entire theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. It, in point three in the 10-point plan, he and Engels call for abolition of all right of inheritance. Now, that that is so rich. I mean, the, yeah. These two guys could not have done what they did without the money they inherited from their parents. Uh, uh, Marx's wife and his mother begged him, Carl. Please stop writing about capital and start earning some capital. And, and, and instead, he, he just built his mother and his father for as much as he could. When that ran dry, he went to Ingalls, and Ingalls got all of his money from his religious, Christian, conservative, capitalist father— and that's where Ingalls got all of his money. And then Ingalls subsidized Marx and Marx's entire family— throughout his life. How dare these guys call for abolition of right of inheritance? They literally wouldn't have had a penny. And by the way, the champion of the proletariat um, didn't pay the family nursemaid a penny. He got her pregnant. And then the child that was born from the family nursemaid, who they named Freddie after Ingalls, because Ingalls tried to bail Marx out again, even on this one, just to save Marx's marriage. Uh, Ingalls himself wa wasn't married. Marx refused not only to acknowledge the child, but to pay the child a penny of ch child support. So the champion of the proletariat, uh, 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 please, uh, Aristotle's right. Men start revolutions for, for often these private purposes. Marx and Ingalls would have liked the system that where some giant collectivist redistributionist nanny state took everybody else's money and property and subsidized Marx and Engels. That, that's, that's what they really envisioned, and their lives reflected that. Yeah, yeah, and it, it is very disturbing because of how this ideology was unleashed on the world. You know, I was reminded when I was reading your book about the private property business, and a lot of people try to argue, you know, well, Stalin and Lenin, they, 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 this was an aberration. And, uh, you know, the way they carried out Marxism, especially the Ukrainian famine where six million people died. And we would say, I would say, and Stephen Kotkin in his books uh, on, on, on the biography of Stalin, it's like 3,000 pages, you know, three volumes, says, no, 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 he was carrying it out to its logical conclusion. And uh, so comment on that, too, the confiscation of private property and the catastrophic consequences of that. 
Yeah, one of the things, Henry, that always gets me, I've been going around the, the country for probably 20 years giving talks on college campuses titled Why Communism is Bad. And it, it usually comes from these desperate students who email me and they say, Professor, I, I, we literally have teachers here, professors with busts of marks in their office for real. Yeah, I never, I, I heard about that kind of thing, but now I'm here at this college and it's true. It, it, the only thing we're hearing about Marx is good stuff, allegedly good stuff yeah. about Marx. Yeah. Could you come, please give us a talk on this? And, and I go there, I stand up there with the Communist Manifesto and I read right from the text. And when, when Marx and Engels write, the entire theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. Henry, the students get it right away, right? They're, they're like, abolish private property? Do they really mean it? And yeah, they double down on it twice. They say, you are, you are horrified at us doing away with your private property. Uh, is this really what we intend? Yes, that is precisely what we intend. And, and in order to do that, if you're going to abolish private property, I mean, you talk about violations of biblical and natural law, uh, Judeo-Christian norms, yes. the commandments, yeah. thou shalt not steal. You're going to have to use guns and gulags to do that. Uh, you're going to have to use prison camps. You're going to have to kill as you said, 100, 140 million people to do that. A 10-year-old could tell you that that's going to lead to, to wide-scale violence. And as Marx and Engels say at the end of their 10-point plan, of course, in order to affect this, despotic inroads will be necessary. <laughs> they got it. They knew this would take despotism. I mean, anybody can understand that. Good idea, good book, hardly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a completely anti-Christian ideology in, in this every aspect of it, but this particularly. Uh, you know, Psalm 50 says, the Lord, the world belongs to the Lord and everything in it. A thousand on the, uh, cattle on a thousand hills. He distributed it to, to humanity. We have private property rights by, by, by that very principle. And you're, exact, right. and you're exactly right. The commandment not to steal in the Old Testament, repeated repeatedly in the New, that this is a violation of God's moral law. And so to, to glob onto this as Christians is a grave, grave mistake. Well, we've reached the end of this segment, Dr. Ken Gore. We're going to be uh, right back after this break to talk about your book, The Devil and Karl Marx. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. Today we're here with Dr. Paul Kengor, and we're talking about his book, The Devil and Karl Marx. Uh, now, Dr. Kengor, we were talking about the hideous doctrine of the abolition of private property. Uh, maybe some people might be watching, however, thinking Marxism, communism, socialism. Isn't that old hat? Isn't that Cold War? Berlin Wall came down 1989. Let's bridge the gap now over to sort of the present day. And the, the fact that this ideology is still so relevant and in influencing people so deeply, especially young people. Yeah, it really is. In fact, probably the most um, popular organization in America today is Black Lives Matter. And, and Patrice Cullors, one of the founders, uh, her and Alicia Garza, she, she said, um, you know, Alicia and I, we are trained Marxists. That, that is our ideological framework. We are super versed in ideological theories. And she says in her memoirs, which I actually have right here, <laughs> She, she says that you know, we spent an entire year reading Marx, Mao, Lenin. And by the way, Henry, this is so offensive because Marx was a racist. And I could, yeah. we could do another whole show just on Marx's really hideous racial comments, which, by the way, are a direct extension of his evolutionary worldview. And so it was, a, it was an evolutionary-based racism. He didn't see human beings as made in the imago dei, in the image of God, yeah. but as, as evolving from apes. And, and he saw 
black people lower on the evolutionary scale. I think if people like Patrice Cullors knew this, that at the very least they maybe just call themselves a communist and not a Marxist. Yeah. But but if, but if but when you point this out to people, I've been through this a lot in the last few weeks. I think almost every interview I do, someone asks me about Black Lives Matter. And and when you point out that what they said about Marxism, the response often by supporters of Black Lives Matter, especially younger people, is, oh, who cares? Right. Um, what What's that? McCarthyism? You're attacking them and yeah. the communist stuff. No, it matters. This really, really matters. And and at the very least, because because of the diabolical elements of Marxism and what and what Marx himself was engaging in. And if you look at opinion polls, I, I've followed this. Uh, you and I are old enough, right? We go back. I mean, I was a college senior at the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I've watched this for 30 years. You could you could you could chart it on a graph. You know, you know, uh, up a point every year, the more and more people who say more and more favorable things about Marxism and the majority of millennials who actually say that they prefer socialism over capitalism. So unfortunately, what I was hoping that, you know, 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall would be a non-issue and I would only t talk about communism and the Cold War in history courses um, how it has now unfortunately be become all too relevant as a current contemporary issue. Yeah, it's a shame. And so so folks watching, you know, especially older folks, maybe have young people in college or millennial kids or family members, niece, nephew, uh, pick up a copy of this book, buy it for them for Christmas, show them the history of Marxism and, and help expose these terrible ideas to the light of day. We really want to encourage people to do that. So, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, in this movement that you're talking about, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, they talk about disrupting the nuclear family and, and the confiscation of property as well. I mean, this is part of their belief system. This is right out of the communist manifesto. Yeah, and, I, and that has all now been scrubbed from the BLM website. In I, fact, heard about, I, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. I wrote a piece for the American Spectator. I'm a columnist there. It's called BLM's parentheses reverse Marxist makeover, and they did. They removed the stuff, the sex. They, they, Henry. They moved the entire what we believe section. <laughs> it's just gone altogether. Yeah. You know, use words like comrades more than once, um, cisgender, heteronormative. We rally to um, to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. In my article, I took screenshots because I knew this stuff would eventually come down. But yeah, and that right there, people say, wait a second, Western prescribed family, uh, uh, nuclear family structure, what does that have to do with Marxism? Actually, if you read the Communist Manifesto, uh, <laughs> among things like, uh, like uh, abolish private property, abolish quote unquote all morality, all religion, abolish all existing social and political conditions, they have this phrase, Abolition of the family, exclamation yep. mark. Yeah, Even the most radical flare up of this infamous proposal of the communists. I've had students read that and say, Professor, what's this doing in there? <laughs> so, well, that, that's one of the things that they, that they targeted. Yeah. And again, if people would just read the literature, they would see this. Uh, it, it, people are really ignorant. And maybe, I know we're getting to the end of the show, if there's any hope here at all, I'm hoping that if people simply take the time to read and educate and inform themselves, they're not going to support this system. This, this system could only be supported out of ignorance, of not knowing what it really is. I think any young person, when you tell them, hey, we're going to take your property, and by the way, we're going to take all of your inheritance, too. You can't get any of your family's inheritance. You know, They're going to suddenly look at their Starbucks cup and their iPhone and say, well, I don't support that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. Well, uh, I, let me. I'll give you a quick comment, and then I'll give you about a minute to wrap up the show. Uh, if 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 students are taught about Nazism, but they're not taught about communism and what it's done to the human race and what how horrific it has been, has killed m many more people than the Nazis killed, and and so just maybe sum up if you could. And I know this is difficult in about a minute. Um, you know, just encouraging people to educate themselves about this ideology, beginning with your book. But uh, beyond that, like, let's do the hard work here of, of telling people about how dangerous this ideology is. 
Yeah, we've done we've done a great job in our educational system teaching people of the monster the the monstrosities of Hitler and Nazism, but we've completely failed on on communism. And you know, one survey find that's amazing is almost a third of millennials, and it's like almost thirty percent of Americans generally think that George W. Bush killed more people than Joseph Stalin. I mean, could you imagine that? Yeah, that, can you imagine that? That's but but that's, that's a crazy. complete failure of education. So, you know, here too, we just we got guys like me, you shows like digging for truth. Um, you know, your network, we need to do some remedial education of young people. And frankly, even a lot of middle-aged and older people who have, who have been uh, failed by, by our educational systems and especially by our universities. Well, that's a good word to end the show. And we want to encourage people. Thank you, Dr. Ken Gore, for being on the show. We encourage people to pick up a copy of your book, and uh, bless you in your work. Thank you for what you're doing. We're so grateful for it. Well, thank you and, and bless you in your work as well, Henry. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Friends, we encourage you to pick up a copy of Dr. Kanger's book, The Devil and Karl Marx. And we pray that you will be enlightened by the work that he's done. Thank you for joining us today on Digging for Truth. Mm -hmm.